praise God this morning. Thank you, uh, Pastor Lindu and the worship team. We do indeed raise a hallelujah. Mm. And it's so good to see each and every one of you in the house of the Lord this morning. It's a, it's a full church this morning. And we praise God for each and every one of you. We've got people from the coal mines of Woodbank, Sister Lindy, and the oil refineries of Secunda. Amen? Amen. I hope you all know where you come from, guys. I've been there. I've visited. Good to see the triplets back. We bless you guys. We've been Amen. thinking about you. Amen. And we know your guys are studying, so we just want to acknowledge you this morning. Church, we're so pleased to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We have our brother from Nigeria, a stalwart, a mentor to so many young people. And we just thank Dr. E for even being present and coming all the way from Nigeria. He's here on, obviously, the medical uh, checkups and so on. So keep him in prayer as well. And keep the country of Nigeria in prayer this, uh, this morning as well. Church, we're still in our series of meeting the Master of Miracles. And like in every series, there are certain chapters that we've got to deal with. We can't skip it, we can't avoid it. And uh, I've got the challenge of uh, preaching science of our times. A very difficult passage of scripture. A, a passage of scripture which deals with eschatology, the perusia, the end times. You hear these words, it's apocalyptic, it's prophetic. All these big words will be thrown around whenever you read this chapter and you go and read the commentaries that are associated with these passages of scripture. There's tension within these passages because everybody wants to know the unknown. Everybody wants to know about tomorrow. More so, everybody wants to know about the end times. And so, this passage of scripture has a tension within it between the current existence and the future coming. Many are so interested with this. Many devote their lives to this passages of scripture and the understanding of what Jesus is about to preach on and teach us this morning. So, let's turn to Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. And uh, the whole chapter is, is dealing with the end time and so on, but I'm going to just read 1 to 13 and then I'm going to jump to 32 to 37. So if you have your Bible, say Amen. 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 Only six people brought their Bibles to church. <laughs> Do you have your Bibles? Amen. 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 Ah, just ten. <laughs> you can have your Bible app as well. That also counts. Are you there? Mark chapter 13, verse 1 to 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? Jesus replied, not one stone will be, uh, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite, opposite the temple. So what happened was they were at the temple. They spoke about the beautiful buildings and then they were walking and they came to the uh, Mount of Olives just opposite the temple. Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately. You know, this is the time where you can actually say, Jesus we spoke about these things and then Jesus said something, but now we have questions. We, we're interested in, in, in times. And so they, they come to Jesus and they ask him, tell us, Lord, when will these things happen? Don't you want to know when these things will happen? Mm. And what will be the sign that they, are to be for, uh, they, that they are all about to be fulfilled? And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, he said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and families. These are the beginning of birth pains. Verse 9, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Verse 10. Going on to verse 11, he says, Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. 
Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Move down to verse 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned tasks, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleep. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Mm. Mm. Let's just bow and we submit the Lord's reading to you. Lord, we just thank you for the reading of your word. I pray, Lord, that you would use it to speak to us this morning and encourage us. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Church, what can we say about the signs of our times? And the signs of our times that we're living in. And how's my time? I've got about uh, three and a half hours to get through this. <laughs> yeah, okay, no. I'm just joking. You see, we don't have wars. We don't have floods. We don't have destruction, famines. Yeah? We don't have all these things now in this world that we're living in. Diseases. People don't lie. People don't betray one another. These are not the times we're living in. They are. Hey? What world are you living in, Brother Byron? <laughs> <laughs> what bubble did you come out from? See, it's hard to preach on something like this when it's so tangible. Mm. It's so relevant. It's so, you can just feel it. You just know it's there. I can hardly watch the news. I, I very rarely watch the news, to be honest with you. But uh, I know, you know, that's why I'm in this bubble that I have. I don't know what's going on around the world. And so, uh, because of the message, I said, let me switch the news channel around. And after scrolling from Disney to this to that, I found the news channel eventually. Just for five minutes, I watched the news. 21 children died in a town, mm. Eastern here. This fellow wants to impeach the president for the money laundering. Then there's another clip. I think it was the EFF. They import violation of rights, something to the other. For five minutes I watched the news. We can see the signs of our times. Mm, mm, mm. Just for five minutes. So if you, like me, don't know about the signs of our times, after church, after this message, go home and just put the news channel on and you'll be very familiar with the times and you'll be very familiar with what destruction and corruption and vile acts that broadcast over the airwaves daily and that's just in our community and in our country. Now the question is, how do we take this passage of scripture and interpret it into our daily lives? And how is it meaningful to us? You see, the disciples looked at the temple. They were there preaching and teaching. For the last couple of chapters, you would notice that Jesus was coming to the temple and they were preaching there and teaching. So in the back of their mind, they're thinking Jesus is going to come to a point where he's going to take over. And when he does, he will rule from the temple. And they looked at the beauty of the architecture and the building that was displayed in front of them at the temple. And they said, oh, what magnificent buildings, thinking they're going to take over that building. Would Jesus, and Jesus tells them something they were not ready to or prepared to hear. That every stone here will be left on one another. Jesus, what do you say? We're not going to rule like the way we thought. So this pattern of thought got into their mind and they were wondering what is going on here. So as usual, when it's time for teaching, what does the teacher do? He sits down. Mm. Notice that whenever Jesus is teaching, he sits down. And then the questions came in. So church, what happens here is, so too like the disciples, we are also very intrigued by the times that we're living in and the end times and the coming of the Lord and all of these things. We're very intrigued. So as we read this passage of scripture, Jesus turns their attention 
to a rather gloomy and scary future. And so they asked him curiously to tell us about these things, Jesus. We too are often so intrigued by what is to come and when we see so many of these things taking place. But what is important and what I want you to pay careful attention to this morning is the instruction Jesus gives amidst the sight. Okay, so let me start going through them very quickly. Warnings and signs that's presented within the text. One of them is in verse 6 of deception. Now many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive you. You see, they knew the master of miracles was the king of kings. So now they need to know what's going to happen when he goes away. He's telling them that deception will take place. Who are these people? I think a good clue is anyone with an agenda. Anyone with an ulterior motive behind their uh, leadership. I worry about those guys. I worry about them. They are very deceitful. And within the church culture and within the church sex, there's so many of people that take what the Lord is doing and what the Bible teaches and what the Bible is saying and twist it for their own self-aggrandizement and for their own gain. You see, they come here to the platform. This is the best place to do because I have your undivided attention. And I take each and every one of your uh, sitting here, your presence, and I abuse it without you even knowing it. Hmm. I preach a message. I preach about Jesus. But slowly, I add a few things of this and that. And then slowly, you see the pastors being idolized. You see them all over the place and shining and doing this and doing that. Beware. Test. Test them. Hmm. Test the spirits. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Mm. You see, the, res the responsibility is on you to understand your Bible, to know what is going on. See, there are so many within the church circles that have abused the name of Jesus. And just to mention a few, we look at Shembe and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the ZCC. And when we look in deeply into what they believe in, there's some occultic things that happen in there that Jesus is talking against. Then you get the other sects and cults that start emerging. The sciences, the religion of Scientology and secularism that sweeps so many believers away from the truth. You see, uh, fellow believers, we need to know our Bibles. Don't just listen to the man up front and say, oh, that was good. That's what the Bible says. No, 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 it doesn't end there. You need to take God's word, you need to study it, and you need to know for yourself what it says and what it does not say. You see, that is why I am a firm believer of expository preaching. Now you may ask, that's a big word, and, and it was a big word to me, I didn't know it until I started studying. But it is just studying the text for what it tells you the text means. Not adding a verse here, a verse from there, and putting it together and giving you something to feel good. That's not expository preaching. Expository preaching is taking a text within the Bible and working through it and working through a series so like now, as we are in the book of Mark, we haven't skipped much things to suit what we want to preach. But we have to deal with all the texts because everything that is within the word of God is God breathed and is good for correction, for reproof and for encouragement and so on. So preachers can easily take verses and twist things out of context. And that is why we need to be very careful of deception that comes in and filters in into our lives and into our communities and into our churches. 1 John 4, 1 to 3 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. That means your pastor. <laughs> that means, you know, your father, your brother. You've got to test everything, church. Mm. The responsibility and the onus is on you. Remember I said you've got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling from Philippians 2 verse 12. 1 John 4, 1 3 says, Test, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. And this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. And even now is already in the world. <clears throat> Moving on, we've got political unrest. 
And uh, political unrest, we look at wars because they always start because of politicians and some person wanting to start wars. And we know, and I could never imagine in our lifetime, in 2022, we're hearing of a war. I mean, we thinking we know how to live with each other, we know how to do politics. Yes, we've got some crazy people here and there, but to invade another person's land, boundaries have already been set, but now you want to have a war? How did Jesus know all these things? <laughs> it's incomprehensible to think what is going on in the world, but Jesus says to us that there will be wars, but what he also says is, do not be allowed. And that's where we as believers come in. That such things must happen. And the end is still to come. The thing with the war shows us all that how closely countries are linked to one another. It shows us that how global effects have impacted even us here in Linders. We all are feeling the pinch, or should I say the punch, of what's happening. Have you seen the price of oil? Mm, mm. Yeah, now I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening in Europe is affecting us here. Mm. And Jesus is saying, do not be alarmed. Mm. Natural catastrophes. Verse 8. There will be earthquakes, famines. Oh, my beloved hometown of Durban. Mm. The floods. Mm. Mm? The catastrophe. Homes just... Sweeped away by waters. Mm. Bridges just broken. People flooded inside their houses. Oh. Been swept away by water. Mm. Destroyed communities, towns, floods. Partially the amount of load shedding we have in accounting is because Durbans have been load shedding. Because of this, so many areas just not able to cope. Even now I'm told one of my cousin's houses in Durban still doesn't have water sometimes. They had so much water, now they don't have water. The water damaged all the infrastructure. So they're still struggling. And we are still struggling because of all of this. So what does the Bible say again? Birth pains. Mm. These are the sign of birth pains. The increase and frequency and duration of these events, they start to get faster and closer as we draw near to the end. We'll move on to betrayal. And I won't go through all the detailed ones, but just pick up on a few. Verse 12 says, Brother will betray brother to death. Mm. Mm. How many of you have heard preachers preach this text? <laughs> it's scary. I, I have found it so difficult to go through this and look at this text and say, Lord, brother will betray brother. Mm. I've got three of them. Mm. I love them all. <laughs> I wouldn't want to betray one another. I can't see one fighting with me or betraying me. But this is what the Bible says. That some are going to experience this. Father, his child, children rebel against their parents. Okay, that I, I probably get that. But, but to the point of death. Mm. But to the point of death. Mm. And I'm sure you've heard stories about uh, certain individuals in a certain religion giving their heart to the Lord and their parents simply disown them. Mm, mm, mm. Some have been burnt. Mm. Some have been killed. Mm, mm, mm. Church, this is not 19 sometime. This is 2022 that these things are still happening. How did Jesus know that? Mm. I can't fathom this. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it is happening. You see, verse 9 tells us of believers, you and I, this is the fun part, church, being handed over to the local councils, Flogged, beaten, all on the count of Jesus and bearing witness to him. When I read this, I was like, Lord, how do I tell your people this might happen to them? They don't want to hear that. Who would want to follow Jesus now that you're going to have to be beaten and flogged and so on? And Jesus said, you know what, Byron, look at, look at that verse again. I think it was verse 8 or verse 6 of deception. Many people who follow these false prophets do ridiculous things in the name of those people that are following. You know, you know the story, eating grass and doing all of these crazy things. They follow these cults to the point where they will do anything for these false prophets. And this is the encouragement I'm asked for the Lord to give you. 
Why not trust the true Savior, the true Amen. God? Amen. Amen. You see, He doesn't lie to you and tell you things are going to be easy. He's mm. telling you what's going to happen. Mm. And He's telling you, mm. even you, some of you are going to face afflictions. Mm. Some mm. of you are going to face persecution. Now, I'll just have a side note there. If it's not for His name and for His glory, that persecution you're facing mm. is not because of Him. You see, he says here that believers, Jesus, Peter, Paul, so many of the disciples were sent to trial and beaten and, and even put to death because of the gospel. So if you're not preaching the gospel and you're experiencing persecution, don't blame God for that. That's probably on your own foolishness and stubbornness. I'm sorry to say that, but we need to be real. Are you actually preaching the word of God that you've been persecuted for if you want to cry about persecution? And I don't think we're there yet. So that's why I say the time of the end is not yet at hand. A lot of things must still happen. So Jesus is saying, trust in the true and living God. Because suffering for him is worth it. Because he paid the ultimate price for us as well on the cross. So when you encounter some sort of persecution, be proud to have followed the footsteps of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be glad to say, you know what? I followed the man who was raised from death mm. to life. Mm. I followed the man who was taken into court, spat upon, beaten, humbled himself. I followed that man. I followed the man like Paul who followed after Jesus, who Peter followed after Jesus, and so many of the other disciples who led the way before us. Jesus tells us in verse 11, do not worry, even in those moments, for the Holy Spirit will be with you to guide you through those moments, even to the point where he will even speak for you mm. and help you and encourage you. Church, those were the few signs of our times and I hope you can familiarize yourself with those times and with those signs. But the question comes to us as believers, what is our position in the midst of these signs? How do we navigate these when we see such devastation, what, what, what do we do? What do we say? What, do we, what position do we take? And I think the key to the believer's response needs to be found in a sign as well. But this sign is a special sign. It is like no other sign ever given before and as will, will ever be after, like the sign of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees for a sign, you know what he told them? He gave them this answer in Matthew 16 verse 4. He says, A wicked and a adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it like the sign of Jonah. Mm. Now you ask, what is the sign of Jonah? Jonah is the one that went into the fish and came out after three days. That is the sign of Jesus. The crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now that is also the Christian believer, to the Christian believer, the gospel message. Now you ask the scripture, what, how, how does this make sense? How is the gospel message? As you see, if you look at Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 4, he says and tells us all, this is the gospel I preach to you. By this gospel you are saved. What gospel are you talking about, Paul? Paul says, it is of first importance that Christ died for our sins and was buried and raised on the third day. Hallelujah. That is the sign of the believer. Mm. The cross, the crucifixion, the resurrection. So in every generation, we're going to have to look at the sign of Jesus. Mm. See, in Matthew 16 verse 4, it says, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. <clears throat> what I found and what I picked up is that every generation has a wicked and adulterous people. So then, what this verse tells me is that if Jesus said a wicked and a adulterous generation looks for the sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah, then I ask you, what generation are you living in? Is it a wicked and adulterous generation? If you say yes, mm. then you need to look for the sign of Jonah, mm. which is Jesus Christ. Can you see how that becomes more relevant now to our times? Amen. Amen. We need to see Jesus Christ as our sign. <clears throat> and this is what we should be looking for. It is the gospel message of the cross to each and every one. 
What's happened so often with our scholars and theologians and so many believers is that we want to predict the coming of Christ, fascinated with the parousia, determining the events and all these prophetic uh, words that they use, the big words like I pronounced before, eschatology and apocalypse just being thrown around and you hear it and you think, oh wow, that's exciting. Why not we use simpler words like grace and mercy and love and kindness and preach the gospel? Instead of worrying about what is to come. You see, what he's actually doing to fulfill the end time is the Great Commission. That was the last words Jesus gave us. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28 verse 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, the discussion around the end times that is so often missed is that every generation will experience the pain and suffering of those times. Every one of us are going to suffer something along the way. We're going to go through disasters, betrayal, deception. It just grows more intense and more frequent like just the birth pains I mentioned and we saw in verses 9 or so. But what so many people do, and what maybe you are also doing, is like you think, oh, birth pains, pregnancy is about nine months, and you try to work out again when the end is coming. That's not the point. The point is that pain and suffering will happen in every generation. But it's our job to look at the sign of Jesus, the mm. sign of Jonah, mm. and preach the gospel. You see, Jesus was speaking figuratively when he was talking about birth pains. And he even goes on to use... Um, the fig tree, figuratively. You see that? Just a little pun there for you. But the thing is, the predicting the end times is simple. You don't have to buy special books. You don't have to go to any special seminars or pay a lot of money. I'll give it to you for free. How you predict the end times. You want to know? Amen. You want to know? Yes. You sure? Eh? You want to know when the end is going to come? <laughs> it's free knowledge and you can also share it with others when you... When you go and I give it to you. This is what it is. This is the answer for the end times. No one knows. <laughs> you don't know when the end will come? No one knows. You know how many people have written books? You know how many people have uh, given their theology and given their predictions of where it's going to happen? Do you know that all of them are wrong? No matter how highly we exalt them and respect their work. <laughs> They're still wrong. Hmm. No one knows the time. No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. Hmm. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody fool you. So the thing we need to focus on, and the thing we need to keep watch, is that we need to look for when Jesus comes. Hmm. And we need to live a life that is just expecting him. Preaching the gospel and expecting Jesus. You see, verse 26 says, Jesus will come in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. That will be the final sign for us believers. Hmm. So we have the current sign, we have the sign of our times, and we have the future sign. And Uncle Steady mentioned it as well, that we look and we wait for the coming of our Lord. Hmm. Hmm. But before that would happen, we have work to do. Preaching the gospel message to all the nations. You see, the end will come when the nations, the whole earth, has heard of the gospel of Jesus. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. You see, some of you are experiencing difficulties. He's not slow in keeping His promise. His promise will come to pass. But some see uh, Jesus' promises as slow. But as some understand slowness, you see, instead He is patient. See, we think God is slow. What we don't realize is that there are so many who don't know Him. And He is just being gracious to us. So instead of preaching end times, live in the times of grace. Mm. I firmly mm. believe we're still in the time of grace. Mm. But the Lord has not come. We still have a chance mm. to accept Him and believe in Him and be saved. Hallelujah. You see, instead He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Second Peter 3 verse 9. And I'm about to land and close the sermon. And I'll start by the words of Bob Atley, which says, Live like Jesus is coming tomorrow, but plan and implement the Great Commission today. 
The signs of our times can be difficult for each and every one of us, but we must be ready. Ready for two things. Ready for the Lord's coming and ready to give the gospel message to those who do not know it. Habakkuk 3 verse 17 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Habakkuk was depressed. He was looking at the invasion of his mother town, his homeland, and he could not see any hope. And he penned these words, fig trees not budding, no grapes on the vines, olive crop fails to produce, no sheep in the pen, no money in the bank, no opportunities for work, not knowing how to pay the bills, sinking deeper and deeper into death. Debt. This is sort of the way he is predicting and the way we relate to it in our times. The devastation and the struggles that we face here, the signs of our times. Habakkuk is mentioning it in his language crops and olives and so on. We look at it in different terms. Money and having things and security that's just going under our feet, just been swept under. Though these things happen, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And that's where we as believers need to be. For the sovereign Lord is my strength, not your money, not your wealth. Jesus has warned us about these things. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and He enables me to tread on the heights. I'm sure you don't want feet like deers, but what a feet like a deer does is able to climb very steep hills and rocks and mountains. So you might find the mountain too high, the mountain too high, but what Habakkuk is saying here, the Lord enables my feet to tread upon these rocks and overcome. Mm. Mark chapter 13 verse 31 and I close. Heaven and earth will pass away. Mm. We all will pass away. But my words mm. will never pass away. Mm. The challenge is for you this morning church, it's a very tough sermon, it's a very hard one to take in. But it is the truth. Mm. And you can take it to the grave. You cannot say it's Byron said this or you can go for yourself and look at what it says. That's what Jesus is saying. That heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will still remain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the challenge for you is to know God's word. The challenge for you is to mature in your Christian faith. I think most of you are believers. So the challenge is for you to take on that mantle and say, Lord, I want to share the gospel. I want to live for you. Because heaven and earth is going to pass away now. These rocks that we see here, they'll be turned over. The wars will come and go. But Lord, you said your words will stay the same. Mm. And his word is true. Mm. It's A and Amen. Mm. So that's a challenge I leave with you this morning, church, is to take God at his word. Surrender to his word. And take on the challenge of preaching his word. Let us bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray, Lord Jesus, as we look at the signs of our times, we are so, one can become so depressed and anxious. But Lord, you have given us your word to affirm us and to secure us of the challenges that we face. That we should know that the only sign we need to see is the sign of Jesus. Hallelujah. For in you, Lord, there is life. In you, there is hope. In you, Lord, you said we will be saved. Hmm. And so, Lord, I pray for every generation that will come and come after that one will seek the sign of Jesus hmm. and know that you are true and that we can see you, Lord, coming with the clouds, Lord, in all your glory and splendor and meet with you and sup with you, Lord, hmm. and know that you are our God and you will take care of us and you will give us eternal life. And so I pray in your name, Lord, be with your people, sustain them, and take care of them, Lord, throughout the signs of our times. And let you be their sign. 
in these times. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.